Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. We need to be free to be ourselves, be who God created us to be, make our own decisions, live our own life, live to please God and not be manipulated and controlled by the past or the people from our past. So Moses ran and God sent him back. Hagar ran and God told her to go back. Now, what about Elijah? I'm not going to take the time to turn to all these places because I've got a six-part message and I'm not even in part one yet. So, <laughs> Elijah ran from Jezebel. He ran out in the desert. He got depressed. He sat down under something called a lone juniper tree, whatever that was, and wanted to die. An angel came and ministered to him, and then he ended up going and standing in a cave, and eventually he heard the voice of the Lord, the still small voice, and it's so wonderfully read in the Amplified Bible. God said to him, what are you doing here? I mean, if you're in a difficult situation and all you do is sit around feeling sorry for yourself day in and day out because you're not in the place you'd like to be in, maybe God is saying to you tonight, what are you doing? <laughs> Anywhere where God has us, he will give us the grace to be there with a good attitude. I said, anywhere where God has us, he will give us the grace to be there with a good, godly attitude. You never know what kind of fruit you've got until it's squeezed. <laughs> you can go to all the seminars you want to on the fruit of the Spirit and sing songs about love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, gentleness, and self-control, but you never know if you can operate in the fruit of the Spirit or not, until somebody presses you or pushes you. <laughs> so don't think that God will not let you get in some hard places because he not only will let you, he will lead you there. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't wander out there because he was lost. The Holy Spirit led him there to be tested and tried. He had to face it off with the devil and let the devil know that he wasn't going to back down from him. <laughs> Little David had to face Goliath before he could ever become king. And let me tell you something, no matter what kind of an anointing is on your life or what you're called to do or what kind of blessings God has in store for you, as long as you're running from things, you'll never wear the crown. I had to confront my father to be able to stand here tonight. <laughs> Along with lots of other things in my life that I had to confront. Now, you know, if you were abused by somebody, I'm not telling them you need to go sit down with them and get in their face and tell them off. God might want you to confront somebody, but don't do it just because I'm telling you my story. You make sure you hear from God about what he would have you do. God doesn't deal with everybody the same way. And matter of fact, it might not be wise at all for you to go do that. But in whatever way you do it, you do have to confront it and deal with it, even if that's sitting down talking to a good friend in detail about what happened to you and exactly how you felt about it and saying, I need to get beyond this. I need to face this and get beyond it. What are you doing here? Second time he said, what are you doing here? And if you read... 1 Kings chapter 19, God told him, I want you to come out of that cave, go back to where you came from, get back to work, anoint a new prophet, anoint a new king. And I love what he, what he said. He told him to anoint Elisha to take his place. wonder how you'd like that. Not only do I want you to get back to work, Joyce, and quit feeling sorry for yourself, I want you to start mentoring other people who will take your place when you fade away in the dust. Well, thank you, Lord. I'm very happy about that. And then, my goodness, what about Jonah? 
Oh, yeah. Boy, was that ever a trip and a half. We got to go read this. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, now the word, verse 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai saying, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee, that means to run, to Tarshish from being in the presence of the Lord as his prophet. Now if you look on a map, Tarshish is the exact opposite direction of where God told him to go. Wonder how many people might be running in the exact opposite direction from the will of God. Matter of fact, I just feel anointed to talk to my television audience right now for a few minutes. Don't think I don't know you're there. I'm not just talking to the people in this room. Wonder how many of you know down deep inside of you that there's something that God has asked you to do. Perhaps there's a call of God on your life and you've decided you'd rather be in business. Well, you know what? It won't work. If you're running from God and you're running from the will of God for your life, you might as well give it up early and you can save yourself a lot of time in the wilderness or like Jonah, a lot of time in the whale's belly. It's so interesting that he ran from God, and verse 17 in chapter 1 says, Now the Lord had prepared and appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now chapter 2 tells all about that belly of the whale experience. Seaweed wrapped around his head and waves coming up over. I mean, it was just, can you imagine the stink and the mess? Finally, when he prayed, the fish vomited him out. Chapter 3, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh. <laughs> no matter how many whales it takes, are you with me? God's not going to change his mind. <laughs> Come on, somebody track with me tonight. I wonder how many whales swallowed me before I finally said, God is God and I might as well do things His way. How many days I wasted in the wilderness. How many mountains I ran around and around and around the same time until I finally figured out that God was smarter than me. Amen, amen, and amen. Now, Let's talk about some ways that we run from our problems. Simple little things that probably everybody deals with, but we don't see them for what they are, so we want to give some revelation tonight. One of the ways that we run is by making excuses. Uh-huh. Luke 14, 18. But they all alike began to make excuses <laughs> and to beg off. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land and I have to go out and take care of it. I beg you, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to examine and put my approval on them. I beg you, have me excused. <laughs> and this is my favorite one. And another said, I've married a wife. And because of this, I'm unable to come. <laughs> Please have me excused. Now, you know, just truthfully, let me say something, and some of you may not care for it, but, you know, a lot of people use the excuse that they can't do anything for God because they've got family. Well, let me ask you a question. When Jesus called his disciples and they left everything, walked away from their businesses and followed him, do you think any of them had families? Peter had a mother-in-law, so he had to have a wife. And chances are he had kids. Whoever said you can't do anything for God if you've got a family? 
You don't want to ignore your family in order just to do some kind of ministry, but everybody has something that God wants them to do. Everybody has something God wants them to do. Everybody has something God wants them to do. Everybody has something God wants them to do. So what is your excuse? Well, I don't want to get involved in anything at church. You know, I did that once and I got hurt. Oh. Listen, I've gotten so hurt in church that I thought I would never recover from it. Don't think just because you go to a church, that doesn't mean you're not going to get hurt. Some of the meanest people in the world are in church. <laughs> the thing we want to do is just make sure we're not one of them. Amen? Amen? What's your excuse? Do you know that I didn't even start this ministry? Now, I started teaching Bible studies at home when I was like 36, I think. And then I did that five years. And then I worked at a church for a while. I didn't even start this ministry until I was 42. Didn't even start until then. And I had four kids, three teenagers, and a baby. So please don't tell me that you can't do anything for God because you've got a husband or you've got a wife or you've got kids or you've got responsibilities. <laughs> or because you're by yourself, amen, that's a good one too. That might even be better why I don't have anybody to help me. Well, maybe after I get married, I'll serve God. Well, maybe after my kids are grown, I'll serve God. Can I just tell you that no excuse is going to be accepted by God? Not it's too hard or I'm too young or I'm too old or I don't have the right education. <laughs> Galatians 5.13 For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Everybody shout out, I am free. I am free. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or an excuse for selfishness. <laughs> I am so tired of listening to everybody yell about their rights. <laughs> let me ask you a question. When does... You getting your rights, when is that okay for that to take away my rights? Amen? I'm sorry, but I don't quite get that. It seems today that everybody's got rights but Christians. I mean, that's ridiculous. I'm free to do what I want to. Well, not if it's hurting somebody else. That's what the Bible says. We act ungodly and we make excuses for it. We make excuses for a lack of spiritual maturity. While well, I'm tired, I don't feel good. I'm grouchy tonight because I don't feel good. <laughs> I'm grouchy tonight and being hard to get along with because I had a bad day at work. <laughs> okay, I'll go on to the next thing. <laughs> By the way, excuses are reasons stuffed with a lie. <laughs> the, next day, the next way that we avoid responsibility for our behavior is by blaming other people. It's your fault that I'm late for work. <laughs> if that phone wouldn't have rang, I wouldn't be late. Well, how about not answering the phone? How about getting up a little bit earlier every day, which might require going to bed a little bit earlier, or maybe getting some things ready the night before, not making an excuse every day, day after day, for being late everywhere you go.
See, if you have a problem being late everywhere you go, then that is a problem. And it's a problem that needs to be dealt with because it's not fair to other people to always be having to wait on you. But as long as you make excuses for it, then you'll never be free from it. Ooh, I hope you guys still love me when I'm done tonight. Now, man, you know, I mean, I don't have time to go to all these places, but Adam and Eve, I mean, God created the man first, and he told Adam not to eat the apple. Then he made him a wife because it must have become obvious that the guy wasn't going to make it on his own. He said, oh, this is not good that this guy's alone. <laughs> I need to give him a helpmate. <laughs> well, what else are you going to get out of that? I mean, you know. And so then Adam goes off to name animals. When he left Eve at home to confront the devil. It's all in the story. Let me tell you, if there would have been a golf course, he'd have been out playing golf. I'm sure on his way back from animal naming, he called and said, what's for dinner? Could you have it ready when I get home? And here she'd been fighting the devil all day. <laughs> and the devil deceived her, and she ate. And when Adam came home, she gave it to him, and he ate. Now, was that her fault that he ate it? God didn't tell her not to eat it. He told Adam not to eat it. And if Adam would have stayed home, maybe he could have protected her. Now, you guys know I'm having a little fun, but there's a certain amount of truth in this also. I mean, I'm just tired of hearing about the whole Eve thing and how she started the whole mess. We've been getting a bum rap ever since. So then when they realized they'd sinned, they suddenly became aware that they were naked, so they ran. <laughs> they hid from God. God said, why are you hiding? Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat the fruit I told you not to eat? Adam? He said, she gave it to me. Now, this mess has been going on ever since Genesis 1. She gave it to me, and then he even blamed God. He said, it's the woman that you gave me. That woman that you gave me, she gave it to me, and I ate it. And so then he went to Eve, and he said, Eve, what is this that you've done? She said, the devil made me do it. And there we have it from the very beginning of the book. Everybody blaming everybody else. People today are majorly running from responsibility. Parents today, because of a lack of just wanting to deal with things, don't even make their kids mind. It's just too much trouble. If a parent gives in to a child wanting an excessive amount of candy and the child gets sick, is it the parent's fault or the child's fault? But today, the way the world has gone, 
If little Johnny eats too much candy and gets sick, mama sues the candy company <laughs> for making the candy to start with that tastes good to little Johnny, and she gets a million dollars. Things have gotten so goofy. But let me tell you something, as believers in Jesus Christ and people who represent the God of all the earth, we are not of the world. We're in it, but we're not of it, and we can't be like it. And we have to be responsible. Now, let me tell you a couple of sad, but hopefully lessons that we can learn something from. And so my mother knew that my father was abusing me because I told her when I was about nine years old, and she confronted him, but he lied about it, and I ended up getting in trouble from him, and how lonely that felt. And then when I was 14, she walked in the house and caught him. She turned around and walked out of the house, came back two hours later, and never said another thing. Now, I don't understand how anybody can do that, but it was fear. It was fear of him. It was fear that she couldn't take care of herself if she left him. And 35 years after that all happened, she finally said to me one day, I, I'm sorry for what I let your father do to you. I just could not face the scandal. Okay, now, I just want to show you what running does to you, okay? If she would have confronted him and put her trust in God and said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm getting my, my daughter out of this situation. God will take care of me. He will help me. How much different my life could have been. My brother's life would not have turned out the way that it did. And her life would not have turned out the way that it did. And I think this is a very important message for somebody tonight. Maybe if not in this room, surely somebody watching by television. You have to confront things. But out of fear, strictly out of fear, she ran and hid, she ran and hid, she ran and hid, and the guilt of it eventually ate away at her mental health until she had a complete, total nervous breakdown and had to take shock treatments for two years. She was never, ever, ever really the same after that. I mean, almost any expert will tell you that upwards of 80% of all illness is rooted in stress. Until I dealt with all that mess in my life, I had headaches, I had migraine headaches, my hormones were haywire, I was tired all the time, I was always going to the doctor with something else that was bothering me, and he'd look at me and say it's stress, and I just wanted to hit him. <laughs> you cannot hide from things and run from things because they will keep dealing with you. Let me tell you something. Any place that God leads you to, He's ready to take you through and to bring you out in victory. Amen? It's time. It is time. It's time to stop running. Come on, let's give God a good praise every night. Lord, I pray for everybody here that needs to confront something in their life that First of all, for them to know that you will never lead them anywhere that you can't keep them. That even though it may be hard, it's going to be worth it in the end. They don't need to be in a hurry. They need to pray and hear from you and then begin to take steps one step at a time. So I pray for a special outpouring of your spirit and a special anointing on people of boldness and courage to no longer run from anything in their lives. I thank you, Lord, for setting people free. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. I do think at times we all have a tendency to run from things that we should be facing. Is there a giant in your life that you believe God is asking you to face and right now you're running from it? Well, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God wants to help you, but you have to approach Him in faith, not fear.
Hey everybody, we are here in Tanzania, and we're in the middle of Tanzania in a land where the Datoga people live. And my first visit here was over a year ago, and the conditions of what we saw here just absolutely broke Shelly and Mai's heart. There was no water, people would have to walk for hours and hours one way to get dirty water. There was no education, and so we started planning and, and asking how can we make a difference in this, and so today, we're here and we have just dedicated one of five wells that we've dug in this area. And these are not just wells, they're solar paneled with pumps and they have reservoirs of 10,000 liters and they will just change this whole community. And we've dedicated a primary school that will, will do grades one, two, three, four, five. So we've literally changed this entire community uh, here in Tanzania and we just couldn't do it without you. So we're so grateful, the people are so appreciative and we say thank you and God bless you.